How's it going? So I got a new setup. I was tired of the um, the old setup. I've got a little something different. I got I, I got my computer and monitor behind me. Um, I don't know how much I'm going to take advantage of that, but maybe. I mean, look, I got a picture of you know, you know, a fallen angel, you know, up here with the Isaiah 14. Hello. But tonight I wanted to do something a little different. I mean, of course, I'm getting on here way earlier, but you know, it's Black Friday. I didn't work today. Um, you know, if I got any prayer warriors in the chat, I crashed on my bike yesterday. I hit a squirrel. Um, I made made it off better than the squirrel did, but um, I got pretty road rashed. Um, yeah, I know all the people who hate cyclists were probably pretty happy to see a guy hit the deck, um, but it hurt. Um, so I'm a bit sore on playing hurt, but you know what? It was actually a good thing. I woke up, it was raining today, and um, yeah, I took advantage by like reading my Bible and you know doing a little research. And and tonight I wanted to discuss a topic I've had on my mind, on my heart. And I was thinking about making like a long form video on YouTube. I haven't, of course, I haven't, I haven't made any long form videos on YouTube. <laughs> so what I thought I, I thought I'd do today is discuss my, basically my interpretation of Nimrod, the dragon, and the serpent. All those things, uh, you know, basically, who's who? You know, I think this is part of the process of kind of maybe unlearning some things that we've been taught and, you know, finding out certain things that we've taught, have we been taught the correct way? Is this biblical? And so, I know a lot of people talk about Lucifer. Lucifer. Who's Lucifer? Well, that's a good question. We're going to get to that. But I kind of want to start at the beginning. Or actually, I want to start at the end because that's how I got to the beginning and that's how I got to the place, the conclusion I came from. And or the conclusion I got to. And so I want to start off basically just, this, is, this has a lot to do with how I got here to where I'm at. You know, so I, I started doing a lot of stuff about end time stuff at the very beginning of, of uh, my TikTok journey. And obviously that my spiritual journey started with, hey, this is the end times. This is time to take things seriously, right? This is time to get right with God because, you know, the time is short, basically. And so what was interesting is that one of the, one of the verses that really kind of struck me, and I'm sure you've seen based on, on the stuff I've, uh, my channel, is... Revelation 9-11. So let's just go ahead and read that. And let's let, and this will help us get to where we're going. Revelation 9-11, okay? And so this is this is basically the verse that kind of got you know got me going. And so it says, They have his king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek his name Apollyon. And so obviously I don't even know I had to look down and read that because I've I've memorized that verse. I've read that many times. But the interesting part about that was when I first started to make the connection between the Nephilim, Genesis 6, and then also the fact that, hey, wait a minute. The, the heroes of old, the men of renown, you know, these half half sons of God, half men, you know, basically, the, the Greek gods are real. So I came to that conclusion. What? Whoa, the Greek gods are real? You know, that wasn't just just fantasy? No, the Greek gods are real. The Titans are real. The uh, the demigods are real. And so I started to understand, like, wait a minute. Apollyon? Is Apollyon Apollo? And, like, it really kind of started to blow my mind that that's what the case was. So, obviously, I went, you know, one of my, you know, kind of one of my favorite videos that I made is the is the Revelation 9-11. The, the two holes in the ground, right? Why do they have two holes in the ground? And I was like, wait a minute. Not Revelation 9-11. This is talking about their king. So the king of the bottomless pit is the Antichrist. He's the spirit of the Antichrist. And so I was like, wait a minute, that's, that's, this like, seems like a big deal. It kind of makes sense they got two holes in the ground if Revelation 9-11 is about the king of the bottomless pit. Like I said, who does, a, who does a whole honor? Maybe the king of a pit. And so, one of the, so after I made that video, obviously a lot of people really liked it. I had one guy really come out at me and made like a rebuttal video. 
and he's got a lot of YouTube followers, uh, subscribers. And but it, but it was a good thing though because it actually kind of made me go back in and, and and do more research into finding out what I really believe about this. And so, like I said, I've I've shown you guys the case that for one, Apollo was the king of plagues as well. And so one of his sim- symbols was a locust. So the king of the bottomless pit is the king over the locusts in the pit. So there you go. To, to me, that was pretty clear. Also, the fact that Apollo was, you know, I mean, the, the apostles are writing in Rome. I mean, so obviously they, they're familiar who Apollo is. I mean, the fact that John goes out of his way to name Abaddon, the Hebrew name, and then he says in Greek, his name's Apollyon. You know, to his audience, they know who he means. And the fact that, what was it, Caligula, Nero, and Domitian all talked about being incarnations of Apollo. So like I said, he's, he's kind of taking a shot at him by saying he's Apollo. You know, he's the, he's, the king, he's the king of hell, basically. You know, the lowest level of hell is the bottomless pit. Sheol, Tartarus. You know, like P- Peter talks about Tartarus. The angels who sin get stuck under the Euphrates, but then it talks about the evil spirits being being stuck in the pit. And so, like, the lowest level. So, yeah, so uh, Peter talks about that. And so, of course, the, the more I, the further I looked into it, I'm like, you know, the more I firmed up my own faith and, yeah, this is the right conclusion. So what I found very interesting, though, is like, so then I was making the, uh, then I wanted to make the case that Apollo was Lucifer. Because if you start looking at this, the similarities between Lucifer and Apollo, put it this way, they're both, they're both like the light bringers, you know, they're like the light bearers. So they're, they're synonymous with light, illumination, knowledge, you know, so that's like what Apollo is, uh, he's the god of, like prophecies, a bunch of good things, except for the plagues and then um, like young men, weird stuff. But of course, so where do, so where do we get the idea, where's, where's Lucifer come from? So here, here's where, here's where Lucifer comes from. And I don't know if everybody always remember, even knows this stuff. This is one of those things where, you know, it's important to remember where we, where we get this information from, you know, because I think a lot of it is we get it from the Bible who, but, but it's interpretations of what somebody else wrote, not exactly what the Bible actually says. So here's where you get, here's where you get the idea from Lucifer from. And it says, and I'll, and I'll read the KJV because, because that's the only place it's written is the KJV. Because it doesn't say this in the other translations. Okay, so this is Isaiah 14, 12. And it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which dis weaken the nations? Isaiah 14, 12. And so like, so as I say, so Lucifer is a translation of a description, basically. Because I'll read, I'll read it from my in the ESV just to see. Because this is pretty, this is pretty standard for the other versions. Okay, so Isaiah fourteen, and it says, and if you go into Isaiah fourteen twelve, it says, "How how you have fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the dawn! How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low." Okay, so I'm like, okay, so for one, Lucifer is not his name. Whatever this, whatever this being they're talking about in there, if you think this is the devil, Lucifer is not his name. Like I said, it's more of a description of who he is. You know, and to be, and to be clear, Satan is not his name. The devil is not his name. We actually don't know his name. See, Lucifer and those things are more descriptions of who he is. Like, a, a, it's like a, a descriptions of a character. It's not really who he is. Because Satan means adversary. Devil means deceiver. So those aren't his name. So really all we do, all we really do know his name is to be the serpent or the dragon. So he's the ser- there's a serpent in the garden and there's a dragon in the book of Revelation. But anyways, I digress because what I, what I really made me think is, so, so we know that Apollo, Apollyon is in the pit, correct? Well, I go to, to uh, Isaiah 14, 14 and 15. And it says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. So Isaiah 14 says that whoever was, was trying to ascend his, to the, like the most high, 
to make itself like the Most High, got brought down to Sheol, down to the pit. So again, so he's going down to the lowest level of the pit. So of course, right there, I'm like, okay, so that clearly to me is there. That's a that's who's in the pit. This this Lucifer being, the the day star, son of the dawn, he's in the pit. Hello, but but the real question is, so is that the devil? Because everyone says that, or this is what people this is what people say that Lucifer was his name before he got cast out of heaven. Well, for one, Lucifer, well, what the dragon is still he in Revelation twelve he fights the archangel Michael, you know. So, and if you look at even in Job, Satan can go back and forth. Because he's because God's God's like where have you been, going back and forth. He's going back and forth, up and down in the earth, on the earth, back and forth to heaven. And so even in uh, in Luke eighteen, Jesus says, "I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven." Now, this is my this is my interpretation of that is that that's a future reference to when he gets cast out of heaven for good. Because at this point, he can he can go back and forth, right? So, anyways. Once I started to really read into Isaiah 14, well, we should probably just look at Isaiah 14 because it's because it's a little bit interesting that the descriptions of this being it doesn't it, he doesn't actually get talked to it like a necessarily like an angel, you know. So I think this is this is the this is the part that I started to actually get confused about because I'm like, okay, so if if Lucifer is the dragon, tell me if this sounds like a spiritual being. And I think the I think the one thing that really kind of stuck out to me was I think it's important when he says he says this is what this is what the Lord is telling Isaiah when the Lord has given you rest with him he says he said you will take up this so uh, Isaiah 14:4 you will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon okay so this is who this is written to the king of Babylon and so when he when he gets to this when he gets to the part of how you are fallen from heaven, O Dace, our son of the dawn. He's kind of saying in a, in a mocking way. You know, he's saying, oh, how you fallen, O, o Dace, our son of the dawn. So like he's taunting him. OK. And then it says, you will you said in your heart, I will ascend in heaven above the stars of God. A lot of people say that people say he wanted to put his throne above God's throne. It doesn't say that. Because there's, there's so many things in here. It doesn't say that people say it says. He wants to send above God's stars. Because obviously, whoever this being is, he knows he can't ascend above God. He can't ascend above the creator, but he's trying to be higher than, than God's angels, basically. He wants to be is higher than them. And it says, I will set my throne on high. I will sit up on the mountain of assembly in the far reaches of the north. What's interesting, it always talks about the, the king of the north is the Antichrist. He's coming down, right? So the, the king of the north is the Antichrist. So he's in the north again. And then it says, and we got back to 14. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. Those who see you will stare at you and ponder. Is this the man, the man who made the, the earth tremble, who shook the kingdoms? Right? So he's saying it's a man, right? And it also says, who made the world like a desert and overthrew its cities, who did not let his prisoners go home. All the kings of the nations lie in glory, each in his own tomb. But you are cast down to your, from your, your grave like a loathed branch, clothed with slain those pierced by the sword who go down in the stones of the pit, like the dead body trampled underfoot. You will not be joined with, a, with them in burial because you have destroyed your land. You have slain the people. May your offering of evil do evildoers never be named never more be named prepare for slaughter sons because of the guilt of their fathers lest they rise and possess the earth and fill the face with world with cities and so i always the one the verse i want to come back to is the one that always kind of really tripped me up when he says isaiah 14 16 those will see you and stare at you and ponder you is this the man who made the nations tremble who shook the kingdoms so is that so from what we just we know of the dragon, the devil, from the serpent, is that what does that make you think of when you see that? Is this the man? 
Because that's what I was wondering. I was like, what? So is the so when you finally see the devil at the end, is he going to look real pathetic? Like this is it? Is this who is this who shook the kingdoms? Is this who brought the nations low? And I think the answer is no, because it's not him. Because I'll I'll sh- and I'll show you why I don't think it's him. For one, like I said, we, we what we do know about the devil because we don't really know his name. We know he was the serpent in the garden. And we know he's the dragon who gets cast out of heaven in Revelation 12. So I would say, I would say the things we know about him are that he's obviously a powerful angel. He's some kind of, he's, he's a powerful creation of God. He was in the garden at some point and he deceives the whole na- he, he deceives the whole world and he gets cast out of heaven at the end. Okay. Now I want to, I want to go into here. So, so there's another prophetic passage from the prophets in Ezekiel. That talks about the devil. Now, this is the devil. Now, I'm saying to me, Isaiah or Ezekiel 28 is where we get the real devil. Because I'm going to say, like, let's let's see how much different this sounds. Because we're going to go right into it. And so, so this is this is Isaiah 4 or Ezekiel 18, starting with verse 12. Son of man, raise lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him. Thus says the Lord, you were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. Sardos, topaz, and a diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, and crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day that you were created, created they were prepared. You were anointed, you were an anointed cher- guardian, guardian cherub. I placed you in the holy mount of God, in the midst of the stones of fire you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness was found in you. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence in the midst, and you sinned. I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God, and I destroyed you. O guardian cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire, your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of splendor. I cast you to the ground. I exposed you before kings to feast their eyes on you. Now, does that sound different from from Isaiah fourteen? Because that because that now no because at no point was that called a man. Because that's not a man. That is the dragon. That's the devil. Because I mean, it says Eden. He was his perfect creation. He was prideful, and he got cast down. He was sinned. Like I said, he was corrupted because of his beauty. Now you said you go back to. Isaiah 14, this was more of like a conqueror, right? This is somebody who conquered things. So who is it? So, of course, I already made the case that Apollo and Lucifer are the same, even though Lucifer, once again, is not a name. So that's not, that's not him. That is not, that's not, that's not the being that's in Ezekiel 28. It's a different, per- it's, a, it's a different being. I mean, that much is clear. Actually, the real question, we can can talk about this for one second. So why do we think that it is? Well, I'll tell you why why we do. For one, people have told us that's what it means. The other thing is, there's a book. There's a book called Paradise Lost. I guess it's a book of like 10 poems, and it writes about this. And so that, that book made the case that Lucifer and the devil are the same being. I don't agree. (laughs) <laughs> I don't agree at all because like I said, it, there's no real connection to the drag to the dragon, the serpent, or the Garden of Eden. It's not there. So so again, so who is it then? Well, what do we know from Isaiah 14? We can already talk about the things that I do know. It says somebody's trying to ascend into heavens, put their throne above the, the stars of God. It's also a lament of the king of Babylon. Uh huh. That might be a clue, right? Who is the king of Babylon? Who, who was the king of Babylon? Who created? Who actually? Who actually started the town of Babel? Well, here you go. So that's when I get into who I who I'm going to say it is. This is we go into uh, to Genesis ten, and this is talking about the sons of Cush, and it says, or the sons of Ham were Cush, Egypt. 
Put in Canaan. The sons of Cush were Sheba, Havilah, Sabta, Rama, and Septeca. And the sons of Rama were Sheba and D- Dedan or whatever. Cush fathered Nimrod. Okay, so Cush fathered Nimrod. See, I think that is a confusing passage because I think people would think he fathered him, therefore he's his father. No, 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 no. Because it already lists, it already lists Cush, Cush's sons. So no, I don't think that's his father. I think that he's a he's an ancestor of Cush. And then it says, it says, uh, Nim, he was the yeah, Nimrod. He was the first on the earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like like a Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Eric, Akkad, Kalna, in the land of Shinar. From the land he went east to Assyria and built Nineveh. Rehoboth, Kalel, and Rezin between Nineveh and Kalel. That is the great city. So there you go. So who started who started Babel? Who was the king of who was the original king of Babel? Nimrod was. So if you guys aren't familiar with Nimrod, do you remember the Tower of Babel? So what was the goal in the Tower of Babel? The Tower of Babel, they said in Genesis Genesis 11:4. Then they said, Come let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its tops in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we get dispersed over the face of the whole earth. So there you go. So he built his tower up into the heavens. He was trying to exalt himself up. So he was a man trying to exalt himself up with the gods, the sons of gods, the stars of God. He was trying to make himself higher than those. So now the taunt makes a little more sense when it's like, oh, how you fallen, oh, day star, son of the dawn. Yo, you were trying to make yourself like the most high, but you're you're down in the you're down in the pit now. You're down in Sheol. You're down in the lowest part of the pit. So now you can start to under, understand that Apollo was a man. Apollo was Apollo was a part of a man. And I think I think a lot of people, you know, see some of the the descriptions of Nimrod, and they start to think in their head he was becoming a mighty man. I think that's I think you might say that in uh, the KJV. So they were trying to think, did he become a Nephilim? It's my, it's my contention that he was, he was already a Nephilim. He was born a Nephilim. Yeah, Nimrod was born a Nephilim because he didn't, they didn't use some kind of science. They weren't doing anything other than just being obviously rebellious toward God at Babel. I mean, they might have been doing other things too. But I think the, the point of like, even in Genesis 6, it says, the Nephilim were the heroes of old, the men of renown. Well, if you think about it, like just being born a Nephilim does not make you mighty. It does not make you a man of renown. It doesn't make you a hero of old. So you actually had to do something. So what it's saying in here that Nimrod was a mighty man, it's actually trying to say that that he was like a tyrant. He was the first. He was like the first kind of emperor builder. He built an emperor uh, empire. So he was the emperor of the first world empire. So that's why you think of like, this is the Tower of Babel was all the nations coming together. Well, they didn't just come together because they wanted to be. A man conquered them and took over the whole earth. And so so it became my contention that, okay, so if, if Nimrod is a Nephilim, well, who's his dad? Well, that's kind of interesting when you start to look into who Apollo's dad was. So Apollo's dad was Zeus. So if you think about, so that's when you always think in in the book of Revelation, it talks about Satan's throne being in Pergamum. And in Pergamum, there was a temple to Zeus. And so it looks just like a throne. And it's like, so Zeus, think, think Zeus, think Satan, think the dragon, think the devil. That's who, that, the sky God, the lightning God, like he's like, He's not part man. He's all he's all God. And so but but the interesting thing about Apollo, I never realized for a long time that Apollo had a like a hybrid mom. His mom wasn't like a fully from like God. She was part God. Le- Leto was her name. And so the interesting part is when you when you start to go into like the historical accounts, there was a Sargon of Akkad is the first real empire builder. And of course, it already says that one of one of uh, Nimrod's first towns he or the cities he he founded was Akkad. So Sargon of Akkad. 
And so, so Sargon of Cod claimed to be like his mom being a changeling. He didn't know who his dad was. And then there's all this sun worship in the story of, yeah, of this, the story of uh, Sargon of Akkad. And he talks about Ishtar. So there's all these, and Inanna. All these stories of like Shimmeramis is like, you would think Shimmeramis, you think uh, Tammuz, all these sun gods. There's like, there's like a sun god and then there's the son of the sun god. And again, this is where the confusing part comes from. And you think about Babel being about confusion because when the town, when the tower came down, all these, all these other religions basically came from here. So what you had was you had a divine father, a sky father, a sun god, and then you had his son, and then you had a divine female who I guess was maybe partially Nephilim. And so that was, that, that's the case that I started to understand like that when you go back to the original, you got to think, now, so we're going to go, now we're going to go all the way back to the very beginning. The beginning of the serpent in the garden. And so this is the verse that I really kind of like cemented it for me. Like this is how it happened. The Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this and cursed, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the beasts in the field. On your belly you shall go and the dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now you see that? I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. Well, who is his offspring? The serpent, okay? Because we already know. We can, we can go into Genesis 6 because I think many of us know that the angels who sinned with the women before the flood, those are the angels that got stuck under the Euphrates, right? Those are the ones who are down in chains until the end. Well, the serpent has offspring too. How come he's not in chains? Because it's my contention that the, the serpent waited till after the flood. And that's why he's the, he was the new God. Like just think about how Zeus, even in the Greek mythology, there was an old, there was old pantheon of gods and there was the new pantheon of gods. And so like in, in the Greeks, like Zeus basically usurped from the old gods and became the new, the new head god. So it's my contention that, yes, that's why. Because the, the original gods are under the Euphrates. They're in Tartarus. They're in the lowest parts of hell. The, the, or at least their sons or ancestors are. And now you have, like, the new god is the, is, is, the, is the devil. Because it said, here's what it says, here's what it actually says in Genesis 6. Because a lot of people wonder, how did the Nephilim, how's their Nephilim after the flood? And actually, the, th the thing is, it's actually more clear than people realize. Because people say, did, was there, some, were there, was there some DNA on the ark? Was there people, was it, did, um, did they come back again? Was it some kind of technology? Was it all these things? Well, look what it actually says in, um, and it actually says, it's actually pretty clear when you actually start to read it. It says, so this is Genesis 6, and it says, when man began to multiply on the face of the, of the land and the daughters were born of them, the sons of God saw that the daughter, daughters of men were attractive and they took them as wives as they chose. Then Lord said to them, my spirit shall not abide in man forever for he is flesh. His day shall be 120 years. And then, okay, so here's the, here's the money verse right here. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards. So when it says those days, I think it's before the flood and afterwards is after the flood. And it says, when the sons of God came to the daughters of men and bore them children to them. These were the mighty men of old, the men of renown. And so it says, they were in those days and afterwards. And it says, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men. So they did it again. I, like I said, I don't, think there's any, I don't think there's any doubt. So we know that more angels sin with more women. And those ones did not get bound. So that, there you go. So to me, that's what it's saying. So it's like, so the seed of the serpent, literally the seed of the devil, was Nimrod. And so Nimrod, though, was like a, he was not, he was not fully God. Apollo was not a fully a God. Actually, I think he said in the, in some accounts, like Nimrod's like two thirds God. I think he's probably like more like three quarters God. I mean, I guess it depends on like, you know, how much of a God his, his mom was. But the interesting thing is like, so in these, in these accounts, so even Apollo, like his, his mom was not fully a god. 
he was a god. You know, like Zeus was a god. His son was Apollo. And so that's when you start to understand like that that's what this is about is like that he was like the first real Nephilim. And all the towns he started to settle. So if you think about why there was giants in the land, all these giants around. I think this was Nimrod setting up his kingdom all around Mesopotamia. He, he destroyed, like I said, he took over this whole place. And that's why Canaan was, was entrenched with giants. They were all related to Nimrod. They were all related to Sargon of Akkad. And as somebody mentioned earlier, Gilgamesh. The Epic of Gilgamesh is like the oldest written account. And it's basically just lines up with right after the flood. So it's like, it's like, it's right on that line of like, this is what happened after the flood. Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh is Nimrod. Nimrod is Lucifer. Lucifer is Apollo. And Apollo is Apollyon. He was the first Antichrist. Like the first rebellion against God was to bring the whole, the whole earth under the control of one man. And that's what's going to happen again. And that's what's happening again. Like I said, I think that's what you, what you start to see is that this is what they want. We talked about the Commonwealth Games. They are building their tower again. They made their intentions known. And look, and so what you saw on that, that Tower of Babel video, uh, thing on, on the Commonwealth Games, they showed a tower being rebuilt. They showed the eye on top of the tower. And they, start, they showed a bull. And like I said, so if you look at Nimrod and and Nimrod and Gilgamesh and, and a lot of these false gods, Horus, Osiris, they're associated with bulls. Like I said, so you think Osiris, Horus, this is Tammuz, Apollo, they're all the same thing. It's it's like I said, it's kind of crazy that it's like it took me a while to kind of grasp all this stuff, but yeah, Marduk. Well, so I think Marduk is is Zeus. So I think there, I think Marduk was yeah I think in to the to the Babylonians he was he was whatever their version of Zeus was. So you think you think you you have your you have your sky god, and I said in some ways a lot of a lot of times they're confusing because they're the same, but at the same time I, I can't give them too much you know too much grief because you have you know we have a, a the son of God Jesus who happens to look like. You know, like he's described as being like fully God. So that's kind of who they are. So even in like to the to the Israelites, you had um, was it El and Baal? And then there was uh, Ashtoreth or Ashtoreth. So you, once again, you had you always have the same kind of thing. You have a divine you have a divine sky God. And Baal was only partially human. I didn't re- I never realized that he was partially human, too. So the Baal, the Lord. And so his his sons were the other the other Baals, were the other Nephilim. And so there you go. I mean, it's like it's it's all it's all the same thing. But I guess my main my main point of all that was just explain that it kind of blew me away that when you start when you start to see the, all the things you read about or you've been told about the devil, the 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 Lucifer, the angels. <laughs> well, what was your question again? I was try- I had a- I kind of had a lot of spiel I was trying to get out there to start, but um, I will answer. I'll start answering questions. But I- I- that's kind of what I wanted to really get out there is the fact that this is the story. I mean, like this is the story of the Tower of Babel, the second incursion of the angels, the the, the Watchers. They back. They're back. They created more Nephilim, and that was basically the impetus for like God raising up Israel to go kill those giants. Yeah, what was the what was the question? I will uh, I will take I will take questions now because I did kind of just talk nonstop for um I don't know it seemed like a long time and I actually uh, forgot where my put my water and now I'm parched but yeah <laughs> well thank you well I think that I think uh, what Lucifer is not Venus I think um, I think some people say that. I think Neptune, Neptune and um, and Lucifer are also they're talking about like I think I think it's Neptune, right? Neptune is the is the planet they call it the um, the the what the day bringer because I think that's the star you see like in the sky before the sun comes up. They actually like, it kind of pulls up the sun. I think that's just just as far as like the rotation of it. So once again, like 
you start to see that a lot of these things are kind of similar. You know, just like it's funny. What's another interesting part is like if you look into um, what is it in uh, before I even got to it in uh, Ezekiel twenty eight was it talks about the uh, the king of Ty- or the the prince of Tyre and the king of Tyre, and so the prince of Tyre is like a king, like an earthly king. Well, you know who they worshipped in? Uh, do you know who they worship in Tyre? So Tyre is like modern day Lebanon. So the modern day Lebanon, they were or in in Lebanon, Tyre they worshipped. They worshipped a, a god called Mel- Melkart. Well, the Greeks knew who Melkart was. There, there's actually a famous story about um, was it Alexander the Great was trying to to go like worship at the temple of Melkart. Well, the people of Tyre didn't want him to because I guess Tyre had it like a, a island city. And so how the Greeks knew. Yeah. So why would why would he want to worship Melkart, the god in Tyre? Well, because Alexander the Great, a Greek, knew what his name was to him. And his name was Hercules. So Hercules was Melkart. And so that's the interesting thing is like that those all these people knew who these gods were. Like it didn't matter what their names were. They weren't they called them different things in different places. But Melkart, Hercules, you look at you look up this, the things about him. He's almost exactly the same as Apollo, probably because he is Apollo. Like Hercules and Apollo aren't different. They're both they're both partially men. But they ruled, they, they ruled, they conquered things. They were kind of good, they did bad things. Well, I mean, knowing, knowing the real story about Nimrod and like Sargon of Akkad, these guys were tyrants, they were not good, they were evil. I mean, obviously a, people, a person like that oppressed people. Yeah, Hercules, Hercules. Yeah, Hercules and Apollo are the same god. No, uh, Zeus. No, Zeus is not a Nephilim. I see. I think. See, Zeus. I believe, at least compared to what it says in Revelation. I actually, well, you know, I got my Bible open. I'll look that up. So this is. Here's how we kind of know who Zeus is. There's a couple. There's actually a couple clues to who Zeus is, because it actually mentions that. Um, for one, this is how most people get it, and so this is Revelation two twelve, and to the angel in the church of Pergamum, right. The words of him who has the sharp, sharp two-edged sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast my name. You did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was killed where Satan dwells. So, so Zeus is, no, see, I don't believe Zeus, Zeus is not Baal. See, Baal, see, Baal, when you think Baal, think Apollo, think Hercules. So Baal had a dad and it was either, da- they either called him Dagon sometime. It was either Dagon or it was El. And El was kind of like the head of the gods. So Zeus, Zeus is the dragon. See, Zeus is the devil. I think Zeus is, because like I said, right there it says that in Pergamum, there was a temple to Zeus. And that's what they say that Satan's throne was. So actually the crazy part is that the Germans got that thing in the 30s. They actually literally took a, took the temple apart and and built it back together piece by piece in a, in a museum. It's still in a museum in, in Germany right now. So they literally went and took apart Satan's throne and stuck it in a museum. So do you know where Satan's throne is now? It's in Berlin. Yeah. Yes, the, the drag, yeah, that's my contention. Dragon Zeus. Well, see, that's again, we talk about, we talk about Satan. Satan is, Satan, like there could be multiple Satans because Satan is just means adversary. So there could be more than one. I would say that any, I would, you could say that any fallen angel could be, could be, uh, could be called Satan. You could, they could be called devils too, because devil just means like deceiver. You know, you could say, you could say like some, some kind of a spiritual entity is a liar, is a, is a devil. But I mean, of course, we talk, I think in our minds, of course, just the way we've been taught that, that all angels have wings. We think that all, all Satan's, well, Satan, every time you see it, it's always the devil. It's always the serpent. When really, even in Revelation, also talks about the, when the dragon falls, he takes a third of the stars with him. So you think about the stars, the sons of God, there's other, there's other powerful entities that, that follow with Satan. So they could be called, they're, they're all Satan. 
You know, even Jesus talks about Satan, Satan divided against Satan. So, and the point is, there are, there are adversary anyways. It's like, it's, you know, it's like, so it's not, that's why we call them Satanists because they're the adversary of man. You know, their, their battle is with us. Well, no, L, L again was like I said, L think, when you think L, think of, think Zeus. And so like Baal would be his son, be the son of L or the son of Dagon. And that would be Hercules Apollo. Just, you know, partially, partially, partially human. You know, so they lived on earth with us. And obviously they ruled over men. Well, see, we, see that was a video I did. And that was actually um, uh, a brother brought that to my attention was that what it says in, in, in Revelation here, uh, 2, uh, 12 and 13, it's interesting because it actually talks about where Satan's throne is. But then it says Antipas was killed where Satan dwells. And so I didn't, I didn't know this until recently either that I looked it up that, 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 uh, Antipas was killed in Geneva, Switzerland. Or he was killed right, or he's killed in the, right, right on the border there where, wherever the temple of Apollo was. He was killed. And actually, we talked about bulls. He was killed in a brazen bull. He was burned alive in this thing in Geneva, Switzerland, on the border of France, where there was a temple to, to, uh, to Apollo. So I think that to me, it's like Satan's throne was in Pergamum, but it says where Satan dwells. Again, so maybe you could say there's more than one Satan because that's where he dwells too. Or obviously Satan could be on the move too. It's like, I mean, you can imagine how personal this would be to somebody like John who's writing this. Well, Antipas was a um, was a saint. He was a martyr. He's a, he's a he's a martyr who was mentioned by name in the early church. So obviously, you could think that obviously John knew him. You know, he was important. You know, he was obviously doing the Lord's work. He he might have been out in Europe spreading the gospel, and they killed him for it. Obviously, he was. He must have been doing something good. Well, he, you know he did something right because Jesus mentions him by name. And he talks about, he calls him his faithful witness. So, obviously, we, could, we would all be so blessed to be called by Jesus as your faith, his faithful witness. So, but yeah, some of this stuff is confusing. But I think that this is why, it's, this is why like, it's kind of been important to me to actually look into some of this stuff. Because it makes sense in the context of like, these other religions make sense when you understand the biblical worldview of what these people knew, what the, what the, the writers of the Bible knew. And obviously knowing it's inspired by God, like these things are on point. And like I said, it, line, it lines up perfectly what, what, they, what the other people believe. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, to me, like I guess to me, it actually makes more, it makes a lot more sense. And also makes more sense that I said, I, the one of the reasons I started to look into the, like the whole Paulo thing was when I started to look into the Art Deco buildings, I noticed that there was all there's all this Apollo love. Like what are the, what's this fascination with Apollo? Even like I said, look at the Statue of Liberty. It looks just like Apollo. Well, it, it could be his sister. It could be Minerva. It could be uh, Diana. It could be Artemis. It could be it could. I mean, the, the Statue of Liberty looks like it could be a man or a female. I mean, there was there was literally a statue. Uh, they called it the the Colossus of Rhodes, and it was Helios, Helios the sun god. Well, Apollo later took the place of that sun god because hello, they're they're interchangeable because it's all the same. It's all versions of Satan. Do you ever heard like what it says in um, that the devil says, "I've got many names." That's why they say he's got many names. Because the old gods, new gods, whatever, they're all versions of Satan. Yeah, so, I mean, it, to me, it's, it seems kind of clear at this point that, once again, you have old, old gods, new gods. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. It's like, so when you start to understand, like, like the Freemasons and a lot of these people, they deify Apollo, or Apollo and Lucifer. Because they say he's the god of illumination. And that's why I say what is in on the Statue of Liberty. Literally, it says on her plaque, it's light illuminating the world. So she's got a torch. I forgot some I, I forgot where the where the famous old painting comes from, but it's Lucifer holding a torch. 
It's saying like Lucifer like holding a torch and she's he's like leading the he's like leading some kind of army. So you have and then you have her holding her torch, illuminating the world. And people would say, what's wrong with light and illumination? What's wrong with uh, knowledge? Well, it's kind of interesting when you think that the serpent in the garden was trying to offer them the knowledge. You know, he wanted them to eat from the knowledge of tree of, of good and evil, the tree of knowledge and good and evil. So they would be like gods. They would know they would know the difference between good and evil and they would be like a god. They would be like gods. So once again, Lucifer is offering knowledge, but obviously he's offering the rebellion against God as well. And once again, for, for people who, who want rebellion against God, they don't want God. They just want the knowledge. Well, that's the thing. It's like, is, is the Statue of Liberty a representation of Ishtar? There's also another God called Columbia. I mean, I'm not going to say that's wrong. I mean, because they all kind of represent all the same things. I was going to look, I was actually going to do this biblical talk in here. Uh, but I decided, I'm, I got another little Bible study topic at the end of this because I decided I'm going to stick with the book of John. But what I found pretty fascinating was that, okay, so Apollo's sister. So Apollo is the sun god, right? And his sister is Artemis, the goddess of the moon. So Artemis is, NASA's got their new rocket program to get, to get back to the moon, right? They're going back, they're going back to the moon. And Artemis is the goddess of the moon. Well, do you know, do you know where they worshiped Artemis? Another, and actually another church in the book of Revelation is the book or the, the church in Ephesus. So Ephesians, the book of Ephesus. Or the church in Ephesus. So in Ephesus, they had a temple to Artemis, a very famous temple to her. And so I found that was kind of interesting. So like, so they, they deified Artemis there. And she was like shown with all kinds of like eggs on her, like weird, like a really weird statue. Like I guess they called them, they were either breasts or eggs. Either way, real weird. But so they worship the divine female. Like I said, there's always a version of the divine female. It really doesn't matter what her name is. It can be Artemis. It can, be, like I said, it could be Diana. It could be uh, Minerva. It could be Ishtar. It could be Isis. Um, well, you know who else it could be? It could be Mary. And I and I don't mean like the actual Mary. I mean the version of Mary that that gets called to God, it, the the one that get the, the one people pray to, because we don't we as Christians do not pray to Mary. Right? You guys know that, right? We don't, why would we pray to Mary? She died. We pray to Jesus because he's God. He rose again. He's alive. We pray to the Father. We pray in the name of Jesus to the Father with the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't pray to Mary. But what I found interesting is, so eventually the, the temple to Artemis was destroyed by the Goths. The Goths ruined everything. So the, the, gods, the gods destroyed the temple to Artemis. Well, in like the the fourth century, I guess the Romans built a new a new temple there. Except it wasn't the temple to Artemis anymore. It was the Church of Mary. It was a Catholic church, right? It was actually a Catholic church, and it was to Mary. So it just so happens that they built a church. To Mary, a Catholic church, and it was to Mary. So it just so happens that they built a church to Mary there. You start, you starting to see the connections here. Are you starting to see why, like in the Catholic Church, they deify Mary because Mary isn't Mary to them. Mary once again is Shemiramis. She's Ashtoreth. She's um, Diana. She's Artemis. She's Minerva. You know. She's Isis. There's a divine female. There's a there's a divine male sun sun god, and then there's the son of the sun god, and that's that's what it always keeps coming back to. Yeah. So when you see Tammuz, it, when you when you start to see like the uh, there's a lot of pictures of Mary holding a young Jesus, like the like the like not even like the baby one, but like the a little bit bigger, and it's like those pictures, those paintings. They're not Jesus and Mary. It's 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 Ishtar and 
Tammuz. It's Nimrod. And I say, somebody mentioned it before. It's like, so you know who, you know whose birthday we probably celebrate on uh, December 25th? It's not Jesus' birthday. No, no, no. It's likely the birth, birthday of Tammuz, Nimrod, the son of the sun god. Not the actual, not, not the son of God. And as I said before, I think I was, it might have been my last one where we were talking about the actual, the actual birthday of, uh, of Jesus. It might be September 11th, which actually I, I'm kind of uh, on the mindset that it actually is now. When you actually think about it, like, isn't that something the devil might pull? So if the devil deceives the whole world, is this something he might do? Is make us celebrate Nimrod's birthday on when you think you're celebrating Jesus' birthday. And then Jesus' actual birthday is a day of mourning. It's a day of mourning for everybody because everyone's all sad on September 11th when that's likely the real birthday of Jesus. And then we're giving presents to everyone on the birthday of Nimrod. How about that? And so once again, the old, so the, the, the Apollyon from the bottomless pit is the first is the first antichrist. And the reason he's in the pit, like I said, he cuz he's partially man. And I even even if we can go back into my my Anunnaki video, my um was it my Anunnaki uh Scooby Doo video? So the Anunnaki, I mentioned, I, I it made me cuz I talk about them being spirits and they could they they had no bodies, so they had to in, inhabit animals. And so a, some animals could talk. Well, do we know who the spirits are? So the spirits are, in, according to the book of Enoch, are the giant, the, the Nephilim spirits. The Nephilim were not intended to be made. God didn't, God didn't create the Nephilim. They were the, they were the hybrid sons of the watchers, the fallen angels. So like you think they had like a, they had like a divine spirit, but they had mortal bodies. So when they died, there was really no place for them. So that's why God put them down into the bottomless pit. He, some, of them were, some of them were actually cursed to roam the earth with no bodies. Unclean spirits, demons. So those were the demons. Those are the unclean spirits. And the head one, the head of the demons was Apollo, the king, the king of the bottomless pit. And that's why it's interesting. We can even go back to it a little bit is what it says about um, Nimrod. And, uh, or now I'm saying it's Nimrod. In Isaiah 14, it talks about them him going being cast down to the pit, and the other kings basically saying, "Oh, look who look who's down here." The other kings, like I said, probably his sons, basically. But yeah, so that's what it talks about. Is like that. Yeah, there was no place for him, so that's why he's down in the pit. And I think that's to me. Oh, I didn't even mention this. I had notes, and I did not look at them all because I thought I, I thought I was remembering it all, but it actually talks about. And so, so how do I know that, that, um, that Lucifer and, you know, the dragon are different? For one, the easiest, the easiest way to, to explain it is, is Satan gets, or the devil gets cast out of heaven. The dragon is thrown to earth. It says in Revelation 12, it says, it says, Revelation 12, 7, it says, Now a war rose in heaven. Michael and his angels were fighting against the dragon. And the, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated and it was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down. The ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And then so, so when he gets thrown down, you go back to Revelation 9. In Revelation 9, 1, it says that, let me see, that did not go well. Yeah, an angel blew his, and, and the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. So the angel who's given the shaft of the bottomless pit is the dragon, in my in my interpretation. That is that's the angel. Because he's the one who gives his he gives his authority and his and his power over to the king of the bottomless pit. Well, so we know that the devil's not letting himself out of the pit. He's letting some something else out of the pit. So that's the point. It's like so he's so he's given his his authority over to his son. And if you think about it, it makes perfect sense because the devil is not that creative. 
he just tries to copy God. He tries to corrupt what God has made good. So he's trying to be, so he's got his son. God has got his son. They're the same. Like I said, he's, that's why you have an antichrist and you have the real Christ. You have the fake Messiah. You have the real Messiah. And so the fake Messiah is coming first. Remember, it's the rider on the white horse. The one who's got a, who's given a crown, who's got a bow, and he's given authority to conquer, to conquer the saints, to conquer us. And then you have in Revelation 19, you have the real king coming back. The real rider on the white horse, you know, his robe dipped in blood, and he's coming down to chop the false Christ in half. Throw him in the lake of fire. Yep, it's going to be, that part's going to be lit. I'm looking forward to seeing that part. But yeah, so that was my, um, that was my, my, my case. Where's the bottomless pit located? Well, we, oh, here's what we know. The bottomless pit is located in the farthest depths of, of hell. Sheol. So Sheol is, sometimes you see like these old kind of like diagrams of what it might look like, the earth. A lot of these maps are, a lot of these diagrams are like flat earth looking things. So take that for what you will. But there's, there's Sheol, Sheol Hades, and then there's Tartarus. And I think they say Tartarus is as low, is, 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 is far below Sheol as we are below heaven. So it's, so it's that much, it's that far below it. So it's the deepest, it's the deepest part of hell, basically. Well, thank you, John. I got, an- I got another Bible study topic for tonight. And actually, I said, and to the people who follow me on YouTube now, or even guys on the lives right now, I've, lately what I've been doing is I, I've, I felt convicted at some point. I always talk about the dark, the dark stuff all the time. So I wanted to like, so the stuff I'm reading in my bu- own Bible study, I wanted to start going into make, putting a Bible study section into to my videos, at least end with one. Always end with it. No matter what topic I'm going to do, I'm going to try to end with some kind of a Bible study that I've done. And and then what I did today was I actually clipped, you know, I clipped the, that part off the end of the live and I put it back on there. Oh, yeah, I will definitely. Yeah. So if you guys always when you guys whenever I go on here now, I put these on YouTube later. Sometimes they put even little graphics. But look, I even got like, see, look, see this guy right here. He Lucifer doesn't have wings, I don't think. <laughs> but no, so I um so I I'll finish this. I'll put I'll put the whole thing on as soon as I'm done with it, probably maybe maybe tonight I might get this one up. Um maybe not. Probably not. But usually the next day I'll put them on. And actually like I said I'm gonna but I'll put the whole thing on and then probably later I'll go back and I'll clip the end off. So if you just want to see the, the Bible study, which obviously is kind of you know the most important part. It's all good, you know. Hopefully, you guys enjoy the whole thing. But yeah, I'll I'll cut the part off at the end and like just clip that just for those who want, you know, the real meat, the the daily bread. Am I religious or believe in God or a God or Jesus or the Bible? Okay, am I religious? No. Do I believe in God? Yes. Um, I believe in Jesus is God. Um, I believe the Bible. And um, I am a I'm a part of the church. Hope that helps. <laughs> Let me see. Um, do the do the Illuminati know uh, how Lucifer looks like? Um, I think that a lot of them. I mean, who really knows? I guess the, I guess the point is the more I've researched into like the Illuminati, the Illuminati is kind of a. Um, I think that's kind of become a catch-all for like a, like a high-level secret society. I think that there probably is some kind of branch of the Illuminati, but I don't think that's really like the only ones. And 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 kind of saying, do they know? Like the question is like which ones? Because the cra- you know, the more you start to look into it, it's like some know, some don't know. The truth is, the ones who don't know will say they say it's not true. The ones who do know won't tell you. So what do they really know? <laughs> you know, unless you're like, unless you're really in the club, you know, you don't know and you probably won't tell me. So I guess the, the truth is, put it this way, 
they what they believe is not true. They now they actually believe some things that are true, and I think there's some certain things they they believe that they don't tell us. And I mean, like I said, I've started to see more and more that I think that the truth is that they believe that the stories of ancient Sumar and the Anunnaki. So the Anunnaki, you know, Anunnaki to the, the Sumar, Sumerians, they they say that they made us. They um, they gave man technology. They did all the things. And if you look at ancient Sumar, it was very advanced. You know, it was, it was equally advanced to ancient Egypt. Whatever that, you take that for whatever you will. It's like they had dams, aqueducts. They had, um, they had, they had real things. Oh, where my, my, oh, my, my monitor went out. But yeah, um, yeah, so they had all those things. And, um, but I think that that like so so the, the the interesting part about that to me is the fact that you can have um, like you can believe in science, you can believe in mysticism, you can believe in religious things, you know. So like the Anunnaki are either aliens, right, or they're gods. You know, they can you can take it for what you will. I think that's the the funny part about that was is is like if you watch ancient aliens, <laughs> they believe everything that those ancient people wrote down, except for the fact that they don't believe that they were gods. They just call them aliens. Where it's like, is, to me, that's kind of a silly thing where it's like, okay, so it really just like, a, it's a matter of semantics, like whatever you want to call them. But yeah, I think that, I think that they really believe in those things. And I think that, I think that someone believe in them because they might have contact with them. I mean, how many of them have contact with them? I mean, probably not that many. But I think some of them, obviously, I think that's why, I think that's why when you have people that, who believe in like these conspiracies that like, you know, they, like how could, how could men coordinate all this stuff? Well, they couldn't. Like if it was just men, they could not coordinate all these things. But the fact that it's not just men, and that's why it's, that's why these, these things can be built up over centuries. Like, you know, if it was just men, these things, this thing would fall apart, but it's not just men. Like I said, it's people serving the principalities, the powers, the rulers, authorities, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. You know, not flesh and blood. And as is is uh, Beyonce in the Illuminati? Whatever version she's in, some version of it. Yeah, I believe she is, because she uh, obviously her and Jay Z. <laughs> they're sure repping the fact that they are. What is uh, Jay Z and Rockefeller Records? I mean, he's, I mean, they're, if they're not, they're sure saying that they are. Oh, that was one, that was one thing I actually didn't get to hit on at some point was the fact that, okay, so here's a crazy thing about Beyonce. Did you guys know that she actually claims to be related to, well, I don't know if she claims to be, but she's, in some way she was related to the queen, the queen of England who just passed, Queen Elizabeth II. So she's related to her. That's what they call her. I think that might be why they call her the Queen Bee. She's the Queen. So you start to you start to find out that there's a lot of these people who they're related to each other. These there's bloodlines that that go across the ocean, across into Europe. And I think that is when you start to really get into like, okay, so who's the Antichrist? Who's who's going to be the Antichrist at the end of all this? Well, that's why we were talking. We talked a lot about. Um, King Charles, King Chuckula, as I call him, because because if you don't, if you guys don't know, King Charles is related to Dracula, and people think, and people always think that I'm making this up. No, he's related to Dracula, but you know who else is related to Dracula? The Bushes. The Bushes are related to Dracula. John Kerry was related to Dracula. There's actually what was it? Uh, it's like I said, I always bring this up. Some little girl did a did some kind of a uh, school project. And she actually talked about that all the all the presidents, I think, save for Trump, were related to each other. They they had some kind of common a- ancestor. Okay, so so now are you starting to put it put a picture together? Like, so how do these people all relate it, or what does that mean? Is that a coincidence? <laughs> Obviously, it's not a coincidence. But we talked about so we talked about Nimrod, and he had many names. And I was making the point of Sargon of Akkad. He was like the first ancient emperor, empire builder. He was the first mighty man on the earth. And so 
So who was Sargon of Akkad? Sargon of Akkad was Gilgamesh, right? Now, well, guess what? Dracula, Vlad, Vlad the Impaler actually was called Vlad Dracula because he was in a secret society called the Order of the Dragon. No lie. No lie. Go look that up on Wikipedia. Look up Vlad the Impaler. You can look up his bio. He was literally in this, he was, he was in a society called the Dragonists. Not making that up. I mean, like I said, this stuff is, it, if you, this stuff is not hard to find once you start looking into it. The Dragonist. I, th- I just thought that was a crazy name. But anyway, so, so the Bushes, King Charles, Vlad, Vlad the, uh, <laughs> Chucked in Paler, as I called him once. He's related to Dracula. And the point is, why would they even talk about being related to Dracula? Because Dracula, he was, he was related to some other king, right? Divine bloodlines. The bloodlines, you got royal bloodlines for a reason. They talk about blue bloods. They talk about us and then they talk about blue bloods. What does that mean? It means that some people had royal blood. And what did royal blood mean? It meant like divine blood. And that's why you have all these kings over the course of like history, kings and emperors, like even like the kings in, uh, in Egypt claim to be God kings, right? They related to gods. Well, what does that mean? Well, when you find out Nimrod, Sargon of Akkad, claimed to be related to a god, and then he had sons, so his sons were related to gods, right? Because if he was related to a god, his sons were related to a god too, right? You know, you're related by how many how many parents removed, or how many times removed they were, but they were related to gods. And then you find out Nimrod wasn't related, of course, it's my contention, he wasn't related to just any god. He was related to Zeus. He was related to the serpent in the garden. He was related to the devil. Okay. And if you actually look into it, and I said, I looked, I saw, I watched this history show on, um, what was it? A history show on YouTube. And Sargon of Akkad, they, it was all about him. And it was a secular show. It was not, was, <laughs> put it this way, nobody like me was doing the show. So they were kind of just stating the facts. They were talking about some of the mythology behind him. And they were saying that, the Charlemagne, pretty famous king in France, was claiming to be related to Sargon of Akkad. Now, wait, what? Why would a king in France be repping some Mesopotamian king? Unless, for one, it's for one, it might be because it's true. For two, it's because they would actually people would think that that's something good. And then you find out what I think it was like King Edward, I think in England was claiming to be related to Sargon of Akkad. And then you find out that there's there's families, there's families still today, and they claim to be called, they call themselves sons of Marduk. Sons of Marduk. So if we already, t- so somebody mentioned this before. So son, Marduk to the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, was Zeus. So who do I say Zeus is? The devil. Zeus is Satan. Zeus, Zeus is the dragon. He is the serpent in the garden. So these people are being, they're claiming to be related to him. It's crazy, but it's crazy. But so, so is, is, uh, is, is queen, is the queen bee in the Illuminati? <laughs> yes, she's claiming to be, she probably claims to be related to Zeus, except she calls him something else, probably. It, you know, it, it you, Sam, you're right. It's it is it's super deep, but at the same time, it's like it starts to make sense, right? Like it, it like the way this world works now, it kind of makes sense if all these people pushing for this this new world order cult, like it it doesn't seem like it's meant in man's best interest to do this thing because it's not. But when you find out, like I said, you got a sovereign God who's like who's using the evil people's rebellion in order to fulfill his prophecies. It starts to make sense. And like I said, and that's why it makes sense too that if they're pushing for this new world order, it's like literally like they're pushing toward another Tower of Babel. They're talking about the, the people across the earth coming together and uniting. Transhumanism, yeah, correct. They're, they're coming together in order for full rebellion against God. And yeah, so the... What did it, wait, so I, was, I would love to quote it from... Um, 
I love to quote, and of course, now that I got my Bible right in front of me, I should just, I should quote it correctly, even though I, I probably got to remember. I, I remember it anyways, but, you know, it, it stands to reason. So this is, this is the verse that you need to come back to is because this is what, it, this is what the wisest man ever said. He says, what has, what has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. There, and there is nothing new under the sun. This is what he's talking about. The things that were will be again, and there's nothing new under the sun. That's exactly what he's saying, because it's like, they're, they, they're, they've always been trying to return to Babel, ever since it got broken down. And, I, and like I said, it's my contention again that, that God separating the nations at Babel was mercy. Because he just destroyed the whole world with a flood, right? Well, in order, in, if, if he didn't break up the nations, if he didn't separate them, well, then he would have had to, he would have had to destroy man again, because man's rebellion was going to be solidified. Instead, he pushed them apart. gave He bought man more time, you know, because obviously, if you if you read into what Sargon of Cod was, Nimrod, this guy was a tyrant. He was bad. So you think about like an evil man, like dictator, ruling over people. Injustice was reigning. It was, the times were evil. So separating it was, was mercy. So that some man could not rule over all these people. And he gave them all a chance. And no, Jesus is, Jesus is not Zeus. No. Like I said, that's what Zeus would... See, that's the point. The Zeus would like to say that he's... That Jesus is him, but no, like Zeus is the dragon. He's a, he's he's like, I guess from what it sounds like, he was the most beautiful created being. But Jesus is the creator, you know, and he's gonna bring everything subject under him eventually. Yeah, Jesus is Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the Word. Like I said, he created Zeus. He didn't call him that probably when he when he made him. That's what he calls himself. <laughs> that's what he told the that's what he told the Greeks to call him, and now and then the Romans call him Jupiter, and then uh, what the the people in uh, Northern Europe called him Thor. You know, it's all once again. There's there's nothing new under the sun. They're all the same. What they talked about um, was it there was also another like was like Baal was a was a storm god as well, or Dagon. They're, like you said, they're all they're all the same. Marduk, storm gods. How did he? Well, because well, you got to read uh, John one when it says, "In in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God." Jesus always was. Jesus now Jesus came was incarnated as a man, you know, around three A.D. You know, probably nine eleven three A.D. But no, he was he had always been. You know, Jesus is is he's shown in the book in the in the Old Testament as well. He think a, angel of the Lord. You know, Jesus has always been. So yeah, Jesus all things were made by him and through him. When the cash of society uh, probably real soon. Yeah, that stuff is uh heating up, isn't it? Yep. Because Jesus had to, Jesus had to become a man to fulfill the the old law, in order for us to um to to basically have a chance. He died. He came as a, he came to be a man to die for us, in order that we could be saved. He was our redemption. He was always the promise. Again, so we talked about the serpent seed, right? The the the, the offspring of the serpent. If that's Nimrod, the offspring of of Eve. End up being Jesus, who was going to crush the head of the serpent. And so it's kind of interesting when you think about it, like he like so God didn't say the offspring of Adam. He actually said the offspring of Eve, because like as Adam was not going to be Jesus' father. Oh, no problem. You're welcome. Because God was his father. And of course, that's again, that's why we already talked about earlier that that uh Mary's not deified because Mary's not really, I mean, she gave birth to Jesus, but, but she was not, she's not, she's not God's, you know, God's mom. You know, that's not, that's not who she was. That's not to take anything away from her. 
it's a great blessing what she did. Obviously, a, that was pretty awesome that she did. But no, she was not. Well, uh, the Holy Spirit uh, basically impregnated Mary. And not in that kind of way. So don't even go there. Yep. Yep. So that was it. Praise the Lord Jesus. Amen. But yeah. Yeah, I think there's certain Catholics who were trying to say that she was basically perfect too. And it was like, it do, she wasn't perfect. You know, like I said, there's, there was Jesus was the only perfect one. Like I said, that's not to say there's anything... You know, it's 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 no it's no offense to Mary to say she was not divine. Yeah, Christ. Yeah, exactly. Christ is a Christ means Messiah. You know, Christ means like Savior. You know, so that's the point. Is like the 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 Christ, and that's why like Jesus Christ was not his last name. That's a lot of times he, they call him Jesus of Nazareth, but he was the he was the Christ. And I think that's why when you see Antichrist. Christ is not his last name either. It just means he's the false. He's the false Christ. He's the he's the false Messiah. Which is which is interesting when you think of when you think of uh, like now they're pumping up all this stuff and I've mentioned this before about like Black Adam, Black Adam. Who is it? Taylor Swift, Deadpool, antihero, Venom, antihero. So you just think about it. So what's a hero? A hero is yeah, anointed one, right, John? A hero is what? Save me, hero. So if you think, think hero, think savior. If you think savior, think Messiah, think Christ. So it's so when they say he's the anti-hero, it's like it's, it's almost like literally saying he's the antichrist. And again, if in the in the movie Black Adam, they actually talk about him being the destroyer and the savior. And that's literally what Apollyon translates to in Greek. Apollyon means destroyer. So he is the destroyer, and he also happens to be the Antichrist. Crazy stuff. Crazy stuff. But yeah, guys, I want to get... So now I want to get into... Do I believe in the Holy Trinity? Absolutely. Jesus even says to, to baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yes, yes. So yes, there's a trinity, you know. Are we son? No, we're sons of Adam, but obviously we're sons of God when we when we when we have when we're re, when we're resurrected in with the Holy Spirit. So obviously we're yeah we were sons of Adam. So it was it was one man who basically sinned that put us put us all to death, and it was one man who died to free us from that death. And that's why we can be called sons of God. That's why it's, some people say that we're sons of, we're not sons of God unless we're in Christ. You know, so that basically we share in his inheritance if we're sons of, if we're, if we're in Christ. But yeah. Well, sons of Noah, well, Noah was a son of Adam. That's just, Adam, yeah, Noah came from Adam's line. He's making up his own religion. Are you talking to me? Limp Linguini? What, what part did you disagree with? Is there still dragons alive? I mean, there's one dragon still alive. <laughs> A real bad one. We gotta, he gotta, he's going to get his come up in soon. Yeah, we can talk about... Yeah, Yahweh is God. Yeah, Yahweh is Jesus. You know when he said, you know, because you know what Yahweh means is, I am, right? Before Abraham was, I am. Jesus was, he, he was the angel in the burning bush. Okay, so now we're going to talk into, you guys enjoyed it. So this, I love this one because because there's a lot of Bible verses in this thing. And we're going to go into, into John. We're going to go into my favorite gospel again. Because we've already done, we did John, John 9, and of course I went backwards and I did John 5. And now we're going to do John 10. And I think this is, this is a great one. I'm just going to, I'm just going to go in and I'll start reading some of this and I'm just going to stop periodically. But they have, so the Bible study today is out of John 10. And I'm going to do the ESV today. And I remember what it meant now. So ESV is English Standard Version. 
And I feel embarrassed that I forgot that the S stood for standard. Okay, so this is about, just to set up, this is about the good shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd. And I'm going to start off at the beginning. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs by in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls out his sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought them all out his, his own, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger they, they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voices of a stranger. And so this, I like, the, I love, I love this stuff because, because you think about like, we already talked about getting eyes to see. And to me, this is ears to hear. Because you need to know the voice of Jesus. You need to know the difference. And so I love the fact that it's like, so Jesus is the good shepherd. And we're supposed to be his sheep. And I said, and it's funny, it's, it's so funny today in a, in a day and age where like the, what is it? It's all about like the goat. The goats are, people, people are saying the goats are good. I got, you know, I got to change this background picture. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not looking at, I don't want to look at the, the ugly devil anymore. We gotta, we gotta, we gotta go back to, um, there we go. Sorry guys, this is, um, I should, I should have done this before, um, there we go. There we go, see? Eyes to see. So, so yeah, what was it? So Jesus, Jesus gave us eyes to see in John chapter nine. He, he gave us the ability to walk in John chapter five. And so this is ears to hear. And so Jesus is the good shepherd. And like I said, really, it's, it, that is kind of the important things to know what, 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 what the, vo the voice of Jesus sounds like. But again, we're supposed to be amongst the sheep. The world's telling you, be like the goat. Well, it's like I said, it's so funny in the sport, in sporting world where goats were never considered good. Goats were the scapegoat. You don't want to be a goat. You know what? There's a there's gonna be a time where they're gonna separate the sheep and the, the sheep and the goats. Do not be on the side of the goats. Be amongst the sheep. But guess what? Don't be a sheep to just any man. Like I said, you got to hear the good shepherd. Like this is this is important to hear the the voice of the good shepherd. To be a sheep of Jesus Christ, the good shepherd. Okay. So then it says, um, and it says this figure of speech Jesus used to them. But they did not understand but what he was saying to them. So Jesus said, said it to them, said it again to them. Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. So think about Jesus being, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Like nobody comes to the Father but through me. Like he's the, he's the door. He's the door to the Father. So he's, he's not only, the, he's not only the, the good shepherd, he's not only the gatekeeper, he's the door. He's the way. And all who, who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, to kill and destroy. I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd will lay his, his life down for the sheep. He who has a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves them and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. And so this, this part is very, very, I really, I really took note of that. When you think about like, so he's the good shepherd. And the voice of the good shepherd, he's going to, he'll, he's going to lay his life down for the sheep. Like you got to go through the door. Like I said, the only way to, to the father is through the door, through Jesus Christ. And so the, the thief is, comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. And so if you think about like the, the real thief, the devil, the devil is, is, he's only there to kill. He, he, he hates us. Jesus is the opposite. Jesus is willing to die for us, you know, and did die for us. But the one thing I found very interesting about this is that he's saying that he who is a hired hand is not the shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees and the wolf snatches them and scatters them 
Think about some of these poor shepherds right now. I remember I did a, I did a verse about, you know, I did like a, a video about this and I need to do another one. Of course, like I, I probably need to get on this. And there's, there's, there's all kinds of people expose these false teachers all over the place. These guys are hired hands. If you're, if, if like you get into the church business for money, I mean, I'm not putting it past, like I know that, that Paul talks about that it was his, it was his right to take some money to be, you know, to basically be, you have a, make a living doing it. Not actually like actually just being, having his needs met. But if you get into, if you get into the gospel stuff or gain, well, look what it says. The hired hand is going to abandon the sheep when it gets tough. Like you think about like the end times. And I think this is kind of what he's talking about. Just think about when the real persecution of the church comes. If you're doing it for money, like if you're, if you're the shepherd for money, those sheep, the sheep cannot count on that man. You know, the sheep can only count on one, one shepherd, the one who already laid his life down for them. And I think that is an important thing to realize is that like the people who are out here doing it for money are not doing it for Jesus. You can't, right? Both. You can, do it, you can do it for Jesus or you can do it for money. Now, obviously, if you're doing it for Jesus, you can have your needs met. But if you're doing it for money, you ain't doing it for Jesus. And obviously, so that's the important thing to, to realize is that, that Jesus is the good shepherd. He's laying his life down for the sheep. The, the worthless shepherd, and there's lots of worthless shepherds, especially in this country, they are going to abandon the sheep. You know what? They already have. I mean, what's worse is they prob- they're, they're leading them to the thief who will rob, kill, and destroy. And I think that is, that is the real serious part is the fact that, you know what? If you're listening to one of those people, at some point, though, you got to realize that the false, the false teachers are actually, like what it says, the false prophets, and I think it's in, in the book of Exodus, it talks about them being, they're actually like judgment on, on the bad people too because... If you hear their vo- like if you hear their voice and you can't tell that's not the voice of Jesus, if you're listening to Kenneth Copeland and you think that's the voice of Jesus, you know what? You want to be deceived. Like you're trying, you want what they're saying to be true. You can- you cannot you cannot read your Bible and know that that stuff's not false. There's a lot of false teachers. That's why we listen. That's why again, you got to know the voice of the good shepherd. If you can't tell that that Joel Osteen's not preaching preaching the same gospel as Jesus is. If you can't tell those people, like I said, even I talk about John MacArthur, he's saying something contrary to what's in God's word, having a form of godliness, denying its power. That's not the voice of the good shepherd. Guess what? John MacArthur is super rich. I mean, he's the one he's calling out. He's calling out guys like um, Joel Osteen, and he's super rich himself. Rich. You know, the point is they're, they're talking about, you know, they're both getting to the same place, right? They'll, they'll, each of them have a foil. You know, John MacArthur just happens to be, he might be more right than Joel Osteen is, but you know what? They're not doing it for the right reasons and they're not, che- and they're not teaching the, what the good shepherd's saying. Okay, so where, where were we at? Okay, it says, and he says, I know, it says, I know my own and my own know me just as the father knows me and I know the father. I will lay my life down for the sheep and I have other sheep that are not in this fold. So, okay. So you think about like at this time, he's saying he's got other sheep that are not in this fold. So he's preaching to the Jews at this point. You know, the the Jews are, are, are at the beginning. They're going right. You know, he's, Jesus is preaching to the Jews, Judah. He was going through Israel. Oh gosh. I just lost my place. I hit the wrong button. Yeah, and so he says, he says, so he has other sheep that are not in the fold. So this is important. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay my life down, and I may take, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. And so, obviously, I go back to that point. It says, I have other sheep that are not in this fold. He's talking about the Gentiles. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice. 
So there will be one flock, one shepherd. So think about that. So when you have people try to tell you that each gospel is for like this gospel for, for the Gentiles, this gospel is for the Jews, this gospel is for the, God's got this different plan for the Gentiles. Jesus says, I got others who are not here and they are going to join me. And then there's going to be one flock and one shepherd. So you know what? Christ is not divided. There is one body of Christ. There is one bride. There is one groom. Jesus is the groom. We are all the bride. We are one in Christ. So that's why when somebody says, don't worry about, there's a rapture for us. It's the Jews that are going to get, the people, the people in Israel are going to get real bad and we're going to be fine because, you know, because obviously everybody's a Christian in America, right? We're all getting raptured. But everybody else is going, you know, like, <laughs> they're going to have it real rough, right? I'm not going to have to worry about the mark of the beast. I'm going to have to worry about these things. Jesus says, there is one flock. There's others who aren't here. I'm going to bring them here. They're going to listen to me. And then I'm going to be their one, the one good shepherd. So I don't think, like I said, I don't think it could be any more clear. Jesus t- talks about this later about there being us being perfectly one. We are all, we are all the body of Christ. We are many parts of one body. We're the, like, we're the stones of the temple of God's church. There's going to be one wedding feast. There's going to be one, there's going to be one bride and there's going to be one groom. He's the one shepherd, the good shepherd. And like I said, it, it doesn't make sense that it would be any other way. It does not. Now, like I said, there's, there's prophecies that directly talk about Jerusalem, Israel, and the end times being kind of, you know, restored. But if you really think about it, it's kind of talking about the place. It's talking about, it's, it's always talking about the remnant going back. But when actually, when you look at the prophecies in the Old Testament, it's talking about like an eternal kingdom. So when, at the end of a revelation, the bride is Jerusalem coming down. Well, Jerusalem's a place. Well, Jerusalem's also the people who are in the place. So if you think about all the believers who are going to come back, so I so I actually kind of like I changed my kind of my uh, interpretation of the hundred forty four thousand. I think that we're I think we're all going to be parts of the hundred forty four thousand, because what it says in Galatians is that is that in Christ we're all one. There's no Jew, nor Greek, nor slave, nor free, no male, no female. We're all one in Christ Jesus. We're all the same. We're all going to be the same. So how can we be di- like? How can we be the same and also have these different prophecies for us? There, again, we are like we are basically grafted in to into into Jesus. Like our inheritance is in Him. So if you think about it, like I said, so we're heir, we're heirs of that throne based on him being covered with him and so yeah once again it'll be all it all will all be the same at the end well the twelve thousand. so i've made this point before that that when you when you look at certain numbers in the bible like some are just symbolic of like complete complete numbers like almost like saying all um so i would say that like so the numbers that are like kind of the numbers of completion are like was like seven 12, um, 70. And so, so I'm, what I'm saying is you have 12,000. You have 12,000 is basically a, it's probably just a way of saying all of them. All the people in that, because each tribe is going, is in Ezekiel, I think it's, is in 49. It talks about the division of the land. And I think that, so all the people who are going to be in that part of the land are going to all be all of, that, that'll just mean all of them. All the tribes will re- be represented, and obviously, I guess we're all grafted into that those tribes. That's my belief. You know, that's my interpretation. But I, I had a different interpretation a while back. Um, but I mean, the way I see it is, I you know I think the one thing is is true that I can maybe agree with some of these people um, that say that there's a difference between like Israel and us and in you know Jerusalem. If you're in, I mean, I would say that obviously Jerusalem is going to be like, I hate to use this word, but that'll be like ground zero for like the action of the, um, 
the end times, like that will be the place where it's like, it's going to be, I don't even want to say it's going to be lit. Obviously, that's going to be where the Antichrist is going to go into the temp- temple and say he's God. That's where the two witnesses are killed. You know, so like that's where like Jesus says, if you see the abomination of desolation, like if you see if you see it with your eyes, because you'll be there, you won't be raptured. You are going to go like, you know, like you have to flee to the mountains. So I'm saying so I think that that's going to be heavier for those people. I'm saying that the 144 are going to be 144,000 will be raptured when Jesus comes back. Like when Jesus, like I said, I don't believe in a second, two raptures. I believe in one. I believe Matthew 24, I think 36, it talks about when the Son of Man comes and the, the angels over all the heaven, you know, he you know comes back for the benefit of the elect. So obviously there's going to be a certain amount of martyrs. Only God knows the number of those. And then there's going to be a certain amount of us that are going to be and alive and remain, and we're going to get caught up in the clouds. So we don't know who we are. You know, we, we, well, we don't know who which one we're, we're going to be. I mean, obviously, you pray that you have endurance to the end, regardless of which one you are. You know, some people are going to have to live through it all. Some people are going to get, you know, I guess at one point it's like if you, the people who live are going to have it probably pretty rough. I mean, I guess if you get martyred, I mean, I guess it won't be as long. Well, the rapture is definitely biblical. I mean, I guess it's like, is the, um, I mean, maybe you're saying that the, the pre-tribulation rapture is, is not biblical, which I'd agree with, but, but obviously in, um, first Thessalonians four, I think, is it 419 where it talks about that they were caught up in the clouds. I think it's, uh, first Corinthians uh, 15, 51. It talks about us being changed in the blink of an eye, you know, getting caught up. It talks about us being caught up. I mean, I think they say it was the the word for it was called herpazo. It's not actually literally called rapture. I mean, that's just a translation of a word. I mean, we get caught up. I mean, we get caught up in the clouds. We get changed in the blink of a blink of an eye. Well, yeah, the word rapture. That's what I'm saying. The point is, it's like if you say the rapture is not biblical, it's like. Well, I mean, none of these English words are in the Bible because it wasn't written in English. But that doesn't mean that doesn't that doesn't mean like what most people think it means. It's like, you know, we are going to get caught up in the clouds, you know, whatever you want, however we want to say it. Um, Now, the real question is, like, the real debate is, when is it going to happen? Obviously, the dead rise first. So if you really think about it, like the 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 rapture is, is first is the resurrection. So the resurrection is in John chapter six, it talks about Jesus saying, and I will raise them up on the last day. So he's like, he's talking about the he's going to raise all the dead up on the last day. And then, so that's why when Paul says that the dead will rise first and those who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord Jesus in the clouds. So if that's not a rapture, I don't know what is. I mean, call whatever you want to. Do you say there's no rapture in the Bible? Yes, we're just caught up in the clouds. Doesn't it doesn't really matter what what they call it? Um, and like I said, that's why Jesus is coming back for the benefit of the elect. Because if he didn't, there would be no flesh left. All the all the good people would be killed. And if you think about it, that's why he's coming back is because if he didn't, we'd all be killed. Well, there's there's the first resurrection of those who died in our who are in Christ, and the second re- resurrection are those who did not get resurrected before the millennium, and those ones are getting resurrected to face the second death. So, yes. So there's a resurrection before the millennium. So obviously, there's your rapture right there. That's your rapture. The resurrection before the millennium. And the one that happens after is so they can go stand in judgment and they can get cast into the lake of fire with the devil and his angels. So, yes, pray that you make it to the first resurrection or don't need to be resurrected because you'll be changed in the twinkling of an eye. You won't have to die first. But um, but like I said, either way, we all get caught up in the clouds. All the believers will get caught up in the clouds with Jesus. Either the dead first, then those who are alive and remain.
The original purpose for the earth has not changed. It says the earth stands in time indefinite. I don't know what you're talking about. What, what, what verse are you talking about? All I know is it says the heavens and the earth will pass away, but God's word will not. So, so the, the, the earth's going to be passed away. It's going to be, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. So it's going to be changed like everything else. God is going to, that's what it says in Ephesians. It talks about like God is going to, like Jesus is going to bring all things to himself. He's going to make heaven right and he's going to make earth right. He's going to do both. If you have a lot of hurt you're holding on to, you can go to the Prince of Peace, my friend. Yep. But yeah, so obviously we talked about a lot of heavy stuff in this one. We talked about obviously all the way from basically the Antichrist to Jesus Christ, the Good Shepherd, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Prince of Peace. Like I said, if you guys have, have heard in these words and you have any fear about the things to come, the things that are obviously happening, the things that are upon us right now, the world is getting crazy. Like I said, this is this is your moment where, like I said, Paul talks about today is the day of salvation. So if you guys have, he- have heard these things and you have questions about it, don't ever hesitate. You can DM me. I have, I have an open inbox. Even, even if I don't follow you, I'll see, I'll see your, your comments, your questions. A lot of people just send me videos that I don't typically watch, especially if I don't know you. Um, but but if you if anybody's got any questions, especially anything that's like regarding salvation, trying to obviously being caught up in the clouds at the end, you know, facing the, the first resurrection, being a part of that. Like I said, do not wait. If you have any fear, if you have any doubt, obviously this is the point of crying out to God, find, finding Jesus here. He says, if you ask, you'll receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. So like I said, I, I'm one of these people, who, I told you, I don't, I don't do altar calls because there's no altar here. And you know what? I, don't, I wouldn't lead you in a prayer. I could, I could tell you, I could point you to the Bible and where it talks about it. But I would say that, that when you find Jesus, most of the time you find it in a personal way. Like I said, Jesus actually talks about like, you go in the room, pray, shut the door. No one has to know, but eventually you'll have to come out changed. If you believe in your heart and you profess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you'll be saved. But I think at that point, that's your first step. That's like, okay, so now you've got it. Now you've got to go walk in faith. And I think about, like, was it last week we talked about the the man who could not walk? He could not walk. And so Jesus asked that man, do you want to be healed? Do you want to walk? You know, if you've been here for a long time, so that's what you have to ask yourself. Do you want to walk? Do you want to be healed? Jesus can heal you today. And um, you can walk. Like I guess so we already talked about. So now we talked about you got eyes to see, ears to hear, and you'll be able to walk. So I think I think it's I think the, the answer is simple. Obviously, do you want do you want all do you want, you know, was it um I love I love it in the end of Dirty Romney when he's saying like uh I lay this before heaven and earth. Do you want a death, death and curses, or uh, life and blessings? Blessing, you know, choose life today. Choose life so that it be well for you and your family. But yeah, the answer is, the answer is very clear. But yeah, if you, like I said, if anybody does not know Jesus, like I said, there's one way to find him: is to cry out to him, and then go seek him, and you will find him, and he'll find you. More importantly, but um. If you guys don't have any more questions, I'm going to I'm going to log off. I hope I hope you guys got something out of this. I feel like I talked to I forgot how much information that was at the beginning. And I can't believe I didn't bring my water. Um cuz now I'm parched. Oh yeah, and I forgot you guys you guys got to say a prayer for me too. I told you I like if you guys didn't catch the beginning of this live, I crashed on my bike yesterday and I got um let me see. So that's that's only part of it. <laughs> that was only that was only part of it. I crashed and um my hip is a mess. Um but yeah, thank you. Thank you. But yeah, um say 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 some prayers cuz I'm a bit sore today. Um my bad dog is um she's a little nicked up too. She's got a bad ear. I think she might have an ear infection. So say so, so please uh please pray for me. Um and yeah. Like I said, if you guys missed any of this live, I said I 
earlier in the live, I talked so much about the um, the connection between Lucifer and Nimrod, the Antichrist, the the King of the Bottomless Pit, and I will put that that will all be up on YouTube. Hopefully, um, hopefully sometime tomorrow morning, maybe. Um, and like I said, for this Bible study part, like once again, I said I told you I'm I'm starting to clip off the the Bible studies. I'm going to I, I put the whole live up as one big live, but then I'll clip the Bible part, Bible study part, just for those who want to see that later. And um, yeah, and like I said, hopefully these these things will all go up on uh, the audio podcast uh, one day. I've been a little slack on that. So if you guys, if, if you want to see this on YouTube later, go to the link tree, subscribe on YouTube, um, follow me on IG, Telegram. I did not. Did you ask a question? January sixteen fifty nine. Is that your is that your birthday? It's pretty old. Might be the. I'll answer your question right now since you tried to call me out for for not answering it. Um, what is it? We're waiting. <laughs> yeah, follow me on Telegram. You know, what? I don't think that anyone asked any questions on Telegram, and if they did, well, sorry guys, because I. I don't think that I saw it. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, January 1659. Did you guys ever see Caddyshack when he was saying um, uh, Judge Smales? Well, we're waiting. <laughs> yeah. I'm still, I got, I'm still, you know, I still got a couple minutes. Uh oh, got the cowboy hat. Right. I didn't time it very well. Yeah. Thank you so much. Oh, I think that I think that, that person was just hating. Because I don't think they really actually had a question. They didn't think that I would stop. But yeah, follow the telegram chat. I I'll just I'll just tease this. Um I don't want to get banned on TikTok, so but I made a video that was a little bit too hot for um, for tick for my TikTok account because I was afraid, you know, I don't want to just say the things I know that they're going to ban me for. I mean, obviously they're shadow banning me for stuff that that I I don't think is against the rules. But anyways, there might be more videos like that in Telegram that will actually tell you guys, hey, I made this video because it's important. It might get me banned on TikTok, but you guys can share this if you want. Let your faith lead you. So hey, follow me on Telegram because. There's going to be some stuff that's not on TikTok on there. And like I said, you can ask me questions in here. But yeah, hit the link tree, guys. Um, I'll try to get on here at least one more night this weekend. Either tomorrow, Saturday. Probably Sunday. I'll probably give it a day. Um, but I'll try to get back on here. And maybe my tag is always uh, JT Follows JC. So you can always find, find me on that. Um, okay, so... Okay, somebody asked this. Jay, uh, January 1659 asked, if Jesus, Jesus fought similarly to how we were fighting against our government. Um, well, Jesus didn't fight against the government. Like, th- that was, actually, that was why he was hated by a lot of, a lot of his, fo- like, a lot of the people who welcomed Jesus in on the cult when he was, when he rode into, Dr- that's, a, that's an interesting thing about, like, this, I, mean, that, I wish I would have got to that question earlier. Because probably a lot of people left now, but but that's a great question because Jesus did not he did not want to overthrow Rome. Remember, he was saying, "My kingdom is not of this world." Uh, Peter actually told us to submit to the authorities because God put the put those people in charge. Jesus even tells Pilate that you would not you would like he wouldn't have his title he would not actually have that 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 place he's at unless God if, if God didn't allow him to have it. So that's that's why a lot of those people, the people who actually were singing Hosanna with the palm leaves on Palm Sunday, just think about this. The people who were who were, who were welcoming Jesus in as a king are the ones who were singing or were saying crucify him on Friday. Think about that. That's because he did not want to overthrow Rome. So the people who are looking for a looking for a savior right now on this earth, the people who want the Q people. The white hats are coming in. They're going to win. All the bad people are going to be arrested. The, the military is doing X. The, um, 
you know, Trump's doing this. Those are the same kind of people who would have said, give us Barabbas, let that murderer go free, crucify this guy. So they said, that's not what he's trying to do. He, we're not supposed to fight against this stuff. Those who are going to captivity, go into captivity. Those who live by the sword are going to die by the sword. Like we're supposed to have our faith in Jesus Christ. Do not fight against the government. The only thing you, the only, the only charge that they gave us to disobey the government is, is remember when, um, when Peter, when it's, when it's about preaching the gospel, do not deny Jesus no matter what the government says. Do not stop preaching the gospel. If you get thrown in jail for that, praise the Lord because you know what? That's what the apostles did. If you suffer for him, that's good. But guess what? Don't, don't fight against the government because they're not cool because they never, because they've never been cool. <laughs> like I said, if the, if, if the apostles didn't fight against Rome, which we know how bad Rome was, well, then like I said, we're not supposed to fight now. We're, we weren't, we're not supposed to fight against the Antichrist. We're supposed to wait for our, the real savior to come. So anyways, on that note, guys, yeah, hit the link tree, follow all of the things, share my new video because they're, because they're shadow banning me. Um, but yes, this will be up on YouTube tomorrow. And um, anyways, love you guys. God bless. You know, maybe they are trying to build a portal to hell at CERN. I know what y'all are thinking about damn time. the new Space Force song, it's fire. Hocus Pocus 2's out guys, finally. That which has been, is what will be. That which is done, is what will be done. There's nothing new under the sun. 